in a market like, for example, like the US or on the continent, what corporate brokers do is subsumed within the functions of investment banks. It's not carved out as a separate thing. I mean, the Americans, when they started to come into the London market in the 80s after Big Bang, they looked around and they thought, you know, these guys don't really know what they're doing and we should be able to progressively eat their lunch. The thing about being an accountant, accounting uh, partnership or a legal partnership is all your competition are partnerships too. If we're going to be number one in Europe, we have to be number one in the UK because UK is 40 to 50 percent of the European investment banking market. You know, we could hardly generate any secondary market revenue off it at all because most of the time we weren't members of the local exchanges. So our clients had to pay double commission. But the idea was it would help us win capital markets business for small cap European stocks. Hi, I'm Steve Clapham. Welcome to the Behind the Balance Sheet podcast, where we meet leading investors and commentators and educate ourselves about the world of investing and the world at large. Our mission is to remove some of the mystique around investing and improve our understanding of what makes a successful investment or indeed an unsuccessful one. Our goal is to inform, educate and entertain. We hope you enjoy this and every episode. Behind the balance sheet and affiliates and podcast guests may own shares or have an economic interest in securities discussed in this podcast, which is aired for your education and entertainment only. Nothing in this podcast should be construed as investment advice or relied upon for investment decisions. Always do your own research. Hi, welcome to another edition of the Behind the Balance Sheet video podcast. I'm Steve Clapham, and I'm delighted to have with me today Robert Pickering. Robert was the chief executive of Kazanov. He's now the chairman of Marex, and he's written this really, really good book, Blue Blood, Kazanov in the Age of Global Banking. Robert, welcome. How are you doing today? Very well. Thank you very much, Steve. It's great to be here. So... We normally ask people, you know, how they got into their their present job. I mean, you actually trained as a solicitor and then decided you could make more money in stockbroking. Is that right? Well, it wasn't quite as simple as that. But uh, broadly speaking, yeah, I grew up in London. My parents were uh, Australian emigres. I went to school in London, then went to university and with a view to qualifying as a solicitor, which I I did. I, I never really expected to stay as a solicitor for very long. I thought I'd do it for a couple of years and move on. But I qualified in 1984. So that was really the, the beginning of the big boom in the city of London. The Big Bang reforms had been announced but not yet implemented. And it really seemed like the city was the place to be. So I decided to move rather earlier than I'd originally anticipated. Um, and left, actually, Alan and Overy, the law firm I qualified with after only being uh, qualified for six months or so. So how long were you with Alan and Overy in total? Two and a half years. But, uh, you know, they were formative years. I learned a lot and I still have a lot of affection for the place. But if you blinked, you would have missed it. Hmm. Let's move on to the book. I, I wanted to kick off by painting a picture for the audience of that whole environment, the UK market 40 years ago. and Kazanov's position within it. And obviously, many of the people listening to this won't be as old as the two of us. So they won't remember. I mean, I'm sure actually most of this audience won't even know the name of Kazanov, which is quite shocking, I suppose. But to be a stockbroker then, you had to be a member of the London Stock Exchange. And all the brokers were partnerships with unlimited liability, or at least most of the large ones were. And practices were quite antiquated. International banks saw an opportunity when the Thatcher government deregulated. Out went fixed commissions and the segregation of market making and broking. In came outside capital. Out went a lot of the old names as most large firms were subsumed by international banks, or at least in part. Now, Kazanov was the premier corporate broker in the market then, and almost uniquely, it didn't sell out but remained a partnership. Oddly, although it was faced with much larger and stronger competition, its client base felt they needed it to remain and to be prosperous. That was true both of its corporate client list, which at one point reached almost half the FTSE 100, and its institutional clients. So, Robert, you moved from Alan Norway, and there was a huge air of mystique about Kazanov. They had analysts, but they didn't publish research. Clients talked in hushed tones about the token house yard offices. 
So we start, Robert, by talking about the myth and the mystery surrounding Kazanov. Your book is frustratingly short of anecdotes about this. You mentioned that guests who left an umbrella had it returned with a precision furrow, and that one day you caused a senior partner much consternation by turning up in a pair of Gucci loafers. You didn't go to the office again with a pair of lace-up brogues, I imagine. But tell me, why was the culture like this? Was it the military backgrounds of many of the senior people? Was it a deliberate strategy to create an era of mystery? What, what, what was it about Casino? Yeah, I think it, it was a combination of things. And I should say at the outset, obviously, all of this predates my joining the firm by, by a long way. But I think that the firm's position in the corporate broking business, which is really the, the business or, of advising listed companies on all aspects of their relationship with their shareholders in the market. So that's everything from the, most, the largest and most complex equity issues, right through to day-to-day -day handholding about uh, continuing obligations on the market and this kind of stuff. And as you, as you said, Casano was, was the dominant player in that market. And that was really a position that had been built up over many, many years. And it was partly, I think, the result of a single-minded focus on that business, really perhaps to the detriment of the day-to-day -day secondary market broking business, um, but also to the flair and um, uh, industry, really, of various generations of partners. In particular, particularly the firm seemed every generation to throw up a particularly talented individual. So you had... Anthony Hornby back in the 1950s. You had Luke Meinertzagen in the 60s into the 70s, and then David Mayhew into the 80s and 90s. And I think that the, the ethos of the firm really was based very much about, around relationships, relationships and integrity and putting the client's interest first. Now, that all sounds very corny because a lot of companies and firms claim to do that. But my observation when I joined the firm in, in the mid-80s was that it was very much true in Casano's case. It really did it. And I think it was, a, it was definitely a product of the sort of military, I wouldn't say upper class, but that slightly patrician military culture, which was ingrained in the firm primarily because of the background of the people who worked there. I mean, the firm really, right up until the 80s, was still at its heart a small private family firm. And it was only much later that it grew into something more institutionalized. So I think that really gave it its, um, gave it its culture. We, we should probably explain, because this podcast has got quite an international um, listenership um, and viewership, the, the, the role of corporate broking. I mean, why was that so important in the UK? And why does it not exist elsewhere? Well, of course, it does exist elsewhere. It's just in, in a market like, for example, like the US or on the continent, what corporate brokers do is subsumed within the functions of investment banks. It's not carved out as a separate thing. But really, for historical reasons in the London market, you had what used to be called merchant banks, the likes of S.G. Warburg and Morgan Grenfell and Schroders, those kinds of names, who provided financial advice and to some degree capital for underwriting to corporate clients but they weren't active in the secondary market. It was the brokers who were active in the secondary market who were responsible for giving market-related advice and also for distributing new issues. So if you wanted to go public, if you needed to raise finance, uh, secondary finance in the markets, you needed a broker. So the broker's job really was to, to, to be the, the bridge between the providers of capital, the institutional investors, and the consumers and users of capital who were the corporate clients. And you had to be able to move seamlessly between those two poles while being trusted by both of them in order to give really good market-related advice to your corporate clients. And in the US, that would be done typically by a, a separate division within the investment bank, or would it be done by the bankers to the company, or how, how does it work? Yeah, I mean, it would be it would be a combination in a typical U.S. investment bank of uh, equity capital markets and the, the you know the relationship coverage bankers. And interestingly, you know, when the U.S. we'll talk about this later, but when the U.S. firms came to dominate in the London market and most of the corporate brokers were acquired by U.S. investment banks, the people who ran the banks tended to think, well, that we should 
get rid of this thing called corporate broking and amalgamate it into the investment banking function in the way that we do at home. But actually, it's been remarkably um, shown remarkable longevity. And most, most of the time, the banks have kept the corporate broking function separate. Now, it's integrated because, you know, you use it in effect as a way of uh, building a relationship with a company and then you can do, sell them, effectively sell them more investment banking services. But in many cases, it has actually been kept separate and, and UK listed companies still have a corporate broker. And you you mentioned Luke Miners Hagen um, as being one of the senior partners of Casino. Uh, he, he, what relation was he to, to Peter Miners Hagen, the, the great rival of David Mayhew um, in the 80s? Yeah, well, Peter was the uh, yeah Peter was the don. Well, David Mayhew at Casno and Peter Minor Targan at Horgovet, um in those days were the two principal corporate brokers. I actually, I think, I think Luke must have been his uncle. He wasn't his father. Um, so, but they were definitely obviously related. And and you said um, you wouldn't you would say it was patrician, not upper class. But Casno was a, a a pretty upper class firm, wasn't it? I mean, before a big bang. Most of it, most of its recruits would have been old Etonians and 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 ex-military people, wouldn't it? I mean, or, or have I got that impression wrong? Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, I, when I when I joined the firm in 1985, there were 36 partners, and of those 36, around half had gone to Eton, and the majority of the of the rest of the partners had gone to other private schools or public schools, as we call them here. Um, but uh, yeah, and many of them were second or third generation partners. I mean, it was different from other firms in the city, only only in a matter of degree, really. I think you would have found if you went to, if you looked at the partnerships in the equivalent firms of the of the day, people like Horgavet or Rowan Pittman. Again, you would have found a pretty heavy overrepresentation of old Etonians and people who had come from privileged backgrounds. But there's no question that Casano was an outlier in the sense that it was probably even more like that than other firms of the era. Yeah, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to imply that Casanova was was particularly different because you know I I, I trained at Orgavet and I think you know to be to get on the sales desk at Orgavet you almost had to have gone to Eton and, and been in the guards. I mean I don't don't know that it was an official written down rule, but you know you could count the number of, of people that hadn't on on one hand for sure. And, you know, if you go back to those days, like the mid 1980s, when Big Bang happened, um, if you talk to someone from Goldman, say, they would have said, and they were increasing their presence in London at the time, quite significantly post Big Bang, they would have told you the British firms were largely amateurs. And I was interested, you know, Patrick Jenkins wrote about your book, and he said, perhaps the most surprising revelation is just how hapless Kavazanov was when it came to managing itself. There are long, aimless discussions with potential buyers and a ham-fisted implementation of a joint venture that always looks set to be problematic. You said in an interview, Robert, that Kavazanov partners didn't meet to discuss strategy until the decision to seek external capital when a meeting was called. I mean, why was it managed in this sort of loose fashion? I mean, I think Patrick's probably being a bit unkind, but... It was a sort of amateur outfit relative to a Goldman Sachs slick machine. Yeah, but and and ironically, proudly so. Certainly in the early days. I mean, and and, and probably that's true of, of most of the most most of the UK brokers at that time would have been similar. Well, that, that's right, and which is you know, if one's being blunt about it, why very few of them are left. I mean, the, the the whole city, and you will know because you were there. It was the very much the the cult of the gifted amateur was embraced as something which was a positive aspect of culture. I mean, I think there was some quote from Anthony Hornby, who was a, a former senior partner of Casno, saying something like, "You know, we like to think that Casno partners are gifted amateurs with the odd person who could play for England." It was this kind of it was this kind of concept. And and you're right. I mean, the Americans, when they started to come into the London market in the 80s after Big Bang, they looked around and they thought, you know, these guys don't really know what they're doing and we should be able to um, progressively eat their lunch. But of course, 
the, 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 the local competition at the time, you know, the merchant banks and the brokers were still very powerful. And most of the Americans actually overflew the, U, the UK in the 80s and really into the mid 90s and concentrated their efforts on continental Europe because the local competition was so entrenched and so strong. And it was really only later as the whole business, the whole investment banking business started to professionalize and capital and deployment of capital and um, risk management started to be a much more important feature of the investment banking business that the Americans in particular gradually took over and one by one, the big US firm, uh, big UK firms sold out or fell by the wayside. I mean, Patrick's comment <laughs> in the review, I don't want to sound defensive. I think I think it's a little harsh. I mean, there was definitely a period around the time of the dot-com boom in around 2000 when um, the, our, our strategy, I think, had not was not right was not right for the times, which was when people wanted equity participation and capital was seen as very important. And we did scramble around a bit in 2000, thinking about whether we should sell ourselves. But in the end, we decided to raise capital and um, and incorporate, in other words, abandon our partnership structure, incorporate and really set about professionalizing the business, which is which is what we did in those early early years, sort of 2000, 2001, 2002. But what was it the dot com boom and the fact that people were making so much money in startups um, or m making money temporarily in many cases? Um, was was that the real impetus? It was at the, yeah, it was at the time, and you know it gave it gave us quite a shock, really, because the the, biz, the, the, the business model of the old partnerships, uh, and again, you'll remember this from your Hogavet days, is that you basically slogged away for ten years at probably less money you could get earning you know working somewhere else in the hope stroke expectation that you might get made a partner and then you would have a a substantial income from the partnership until you retired age sixty. But in 2000, in the dot-com boom, you were having people raising large amounts of capital on the base of, basis of nothing more than a business plan and becoming paper millionaires overnight. So that model of the old-fashioned model of partnership just didn't appeal to people anymore. And no one apart from the 80 um, equity partners at Casno had any equity participation at all. And that just increasingly people found that that just didn't work for them. Now, it, it, it all reversed itself quite quickly as the dot-com boom uh, start turn to bust, but it, it was really, as we saw, an existential crisis for us. And we thought our partnership structure, which we had traditionally regarded as one of our principal strengths, looked like something was which was actually holding the business back. So that's why we decided. Well, there was a there was a, a feeling that maybe we should look to find a partner. In other words, I mean that's a euphemism essentially for selling the business. And we did have some desultory conversations, notably with Merrill Lynch, which didn't lead anywhere, thank goodness, because I think it would have been a disaster at that time. Um, and so the, the other alternative we always looked at was, as I say, a, incorporating and raising some external finance, which we did. And we raised £200 million in external capital, £100 million of equity and £100 million of debt at a billion pound valuation. So at the time, it was seen as quite a coup and a real vote of confidence in the firm from its institutional investors, who basically were the people who put up the capital. But it was all done with a view. If you look at other partnership structures, you know, the, account the accountants and lawyers didn't sort of, you know, change in, in the in dot-com boom. I was just wondering, was it were you actually seeing talent actively leaving? And was this a reflection of the fact that this was nearly 15 years after Big Bang? and You'd, you'd grown quite a bit. And so you'd lost that kind of patrician structure where, you know, people were often connected either through the school or the family. And, and it was therefore more difficult to retain talent. Was it a reflection of a change that had happened, do you think? It, it, was, it was a little bit like that. I mean, we saw the, the irony was that the, the really profitable part of the firm was the corporate finance business. And... Uh, we had a pretty good stability in that part of the business, even through the dot-com boom. The, the equities business is where you tend to have a lot of turnover in staff. And there, you know, you talk about the accountants and the lawyers. 
The thing about being an accountant, accounting uh, partnership or a legal partnership is all your competition are partnerships too. So your people can't say, well, I'm going to go and work somewhere else and they're going to give me equity on day one. It wasn't the case for us. Our competition were not partnerships anymore. They were huge international banks uh, able to offer equity participation or equity incentivization to their people. So, you know, it was areas like equity research, which traditionally has quite high turnover anyway, that we found we were starting to lose people. And that can undermine the confid- an organization's confidence quite quickly when you start to lose people and then you start to think, crikey, oh, we, sure. you know, we have to do something. Mm-hmm. No, I'm sure. Have you ever sort of wondered what might have happened if the firm had taken external money earlier or if it had tried to stay independent? Have you thought about, you know, I know that it was the world was becoming more international then and you wanted capital to expand overseas and obviously the world's much more joined up today. But do you think Kazanov could have survived as a, as an independent partnership? Well, I think that's kind of... Le- if you kind of stuck it out. Well, I think the partnership thing is almost a distraction, really. I mean, I think looking at the business model in a way is more is more relevant. I mean, I don't think there are many yeah, yeah. there are many p- pure independent partnerships left. Uh, so the, the 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 thing that we didn't realize or that we didn't reckon on was we thought in 2000 when we incorporated uh, we raised all this capital. We thought we were going to continue to grow and we thought capital was going to become more important in our business. In fact, as you'll recall, once the dot com bubble burst, the market started to fall and it carried on falling. I think from mid 2000, it didn't stop falling until after the Gulf War at the beginning of 2003, by which time it had lost 50% of its value. And those kinds of market conditions are absolute poison for a business like Casno, which relies on IPOs and M&A and secondary market activity. A little bit like today's market conditions, in fact, although more extreme. So we raised all this capital at a very high valuation but it turned out we didn't actually need the capital at all. So all it did was depress our returns. <laughs> and, um, and of course, we didn't carry on growing. We actually ended up shrinking. And what happened was that we'd, you know, the core business of the firm had been so profitable in the run up to 2000 that it, um, it enabled the firm to get away with, for example, having international operations that lost money, I mean, in a way, the single biggest mistake, in my opinion, was not to invest much more heavily in the asset management side of the business, which you know catered to high net worth individuals and charities, some private, uh, some pension funds too, and that was really neglected. Um, and of course, once market conditions turned down in the beginning of two thousand and one, those drags on profits became a much bigger problem because the core business started to to go down. So. It, that was quite a difficult period. I mean, I think as to whether we could have stayed independent, I mean, I, that in a way was a question that came later when we ended up doing our deal with JP Morgan in, in the mid noughties. Um, I, mean, I think the answer is yes, in some shape or form. But the business that we were in, uh, which was doing big deals for big companies, as I, as I mentioned, our competition was no longer other stock exchange firms that looked a bit like us, or even people like you know, Kleinwald Benson or BZW, who had been relatively easy for us to fend off. You know, they were, it was Goldman Sachs, it was Morgan Stanley, it was Merrill Lynch. You know, so there was not just a problem in terms of matching their capability, but there was a perception problem for us too. You know, if you're BP or you're um, Unilever, you know, are you really going to use Little Casanova to do a, you know, a major transformational merger? It was that kind of perception problem as much as anything that became... An issue for us. Interesting. So you you did the deal with J.P. Morgan, and you decided to structure that as a joint venture because it was done during that bear market, two thousand two thousand three, low volumes, no IPOs. Did you consider any other structures? And can you talk a little bit about the pros and cons of JVs. Yeah, sure. I mean, we, we, well, we we did. I mean, basically, what happened is we restructured the business in the early noughties, and then. In around 2004, market conditions started to improve. Our business started to improve. But what happened was the, the, the big international banks, and they'd, as, you, as you'll remember, there had been a big shakeout at this point. And one by one, the, the kind of domestic competition had, had thrown in the towel in one way or another, whether it was Warburgs or Kleinwaltz or Schroders or Flemings. 
And so really the, the landscape was, again, dominated by Goldman, Morgan Stanley, Merrill, people like that. And they had dismissed corporate broking as a kind of domestic quirk, which they could ignore. So they didn't really pay much attention to it. But in around the mid uh, 2000s, they changed this strategy, which, as I said, had been to overfly the UK and concentrate on the Europe, uh, on continental Europe and say, well, if we're going to be number one in Europe, we have to be number one in the UK because UK is 40 to 50 percent of the European investment banking market. So um, it was clear that they were going to make a big push on the UK and that they all came to the same conclusion, which was that the way to do that was to either buy or build corporate broking businesses because corporate broking had the best relationships with senior level managers in UK corporates. So that they had, they, there was a series of raids on other firms and you know, even Goldman Sachs who you know, are very well known for cherry picking business and not getting involved in things that aren't gonna make money for them. Um, they started a corporate broking business. So we at Casino figured, well, you know, we, we, we have our strategic challenges, but we are still by far the leading franchise in corporate broking. At that point, we were still acting for around 50% of the FTSE 100, about a third of the FTSE 250, you know, far and away, that, you know, at least twice as big a client list as the next biggest um, competitor. So we knew that we were going to be on the receiving end of a lot of interest, and that's exactly what happened. So we were approached by pretty much all the big investment banks with varying degrees of seriousness, Goldman an exception, and we had conversations of varying degrees of seriousness with all those with all those banks. Um, the main ones we ended up, and this is all you know, this is all in the book, so it's all in the public domain now. The, the main series of conversations we had were actually. Uh, with Lehman Brothers, which sounds a bit fanciful today, but you have to cast your mind back to 2004. And Lehman were doing very well at the time. They were building their business aggressively in Europe. And the idea was, well, if we put Casanova and Lehman together, we can build a business which would challenge the bulge bracket firms in London. I mean, obviously, with hindsight, it would have been a disaster. And the idea didn't survive scrutiny. Uh, but for a while, it looked like an interesting option. I think the, the, definitely the heat was going out of those discussions. And we had a call from Ian Hannum at um, JP Morgan saying that they were interested in coming to see us and putting to us this notion that we would, instead of them buying us, they w we would do this joint venture under which they injected their UK investment banking business into us in exchange for 50% of the enlarged business. It was a bit more complicated than that, but that's the, that's the essence of it. We didn't actually take the things terribly seriously to start with because it seemed to us to be very complicated. Uh, sorry, we in this context is David Mayhew, who was the chairman at that point, and I, and I was the chief executive. And, and psychologically, we were over the hurdle of thinking that we, could, we should sell the business and integrate ourselves within one of these large banks. So it took us a while. And also, to be honest, I, I didn't believe for a very long time that when it came to it, JP Morgan would actually go through with it. I thought they're taking a big risk with a very important part of their business. And uh, I wouldn't have taken that risk in their position. So there was a lot of sort of phony war dancing around the subject for a month or two until the conversations really got serious at the end of the summer. After you, you did that deal, you described in the book the post-deal atmosphere as near panic. Why? Why was that? And what would you, you know, knowing that, what would you have done differently to prepare both sides, or can you do anything in a joint venture structure to ensure a smooth transition? It's quite difficult, isn't it? Well, it is difficult, and I think it was always, it was always going to be difficult. So, yeah, I mean, what what happened was that after I don't know five or six months of negotiation, we eventually announced the transaction at the beginning of November in two thousand and four. And as I said, they they injected their UK investment banking business into cat, and the whole thing became labelled J P Morgan Casino. And they own 50% of the business. We own 50% of the business. We had management control. I mean, it was all kind of, it was all hedged around by a shareholders agreement. But David Mayhew was the chairman. I was the chief executive. Uh, a chap called Michael Power, who was our, had been the Casino finance director, was the finance director. So we had the three management slots. And around 70 bankers from JP Morgan physically upstixed from their uh, building in 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 Aldermanbury in the city, and 
came into our building, which is only about three or 400 meters away, but, you know, culturally a completely different world. So um, the answer to your question is what could we have done to prepare? Well, is to have done some preparation. I mean, the problem we, was that we spent months negotiating shareholder agreements and revenue sharing agreements and all the paraphernalia that goes with that and not nearly enough time thinking about how are we going to address the concerns of individuals and how are we going to deal with that and what's the right level of staffing. And I think, to be honest, both sides were equally to blame. We, there was a fundamental, in some respects, um, mismatch of expectations. I mean, I think the strategic objective of the joint venture was clear, which was that we would take essentially JP Morgan global capability and match it with Casanova clients and client handling skills, and two plus two would make more than four. And as, as it happened, from a business point of view, that concept was, was proven from very early days. But we at Casanova kind of thought, well, we're going to JP Morgan, uh, Casanovaize all these JP Morgan people who are coming over to us. And the JP Morgan people thought they were going to JP Morganize all these Casanova people. Uh, so the whole thing was a sort of, um, was an unfortunate mismatch. It caused, it did cause a lot of friction. I, I, I don't think we would ever have been able to eliminate that, but I think with proper planning, much more uh, diligent communication and understanding, a mutual understanding of each other's concerns, I think we could have headed off a lot of it. But it was, it was pretty difficult for quite a long period of time from a, from a human point of view. Well, I hope you're enjoying this episode. And if so, you're bound to enjoy our free newsletter on Substack. It's a weekly email I send out each Sunday morning on interesting investing related topics. Just visit behindthebalancesheet.com and hit that little sign up button on the top right. And while you're there, you should check out our fabulous online investor training school. Hundreds of students have taken our flagship Analyst Academy course, which teaches you everything you need to become a serious equity investor. And if you're a professional investor, we also run a forensic accounting course for institutional clients and a cohort based course for smaller funds and for serious amateurs. Email me at info at behind the balance sheet.com for more information. And I mean, you lost, I think, 15 brokerships, you said, to in, post the deal, including Diageo, BAA, which of course doesn't exist anymore, HBOS, Marks and Spencers, Prudential, and Centrica. I mean, how did it feel to be on the losing side? I mean, it must have been awful for morale. And why did these companies just not trust you the same way? I mean, or were they just more open to being poached? Or what happened? Well, it's it's an interesting it's an interesting question. I mean, I think the the reason it happened isn't. I mean, we said to ourselves at the time, well, this has got nothing to do with the joint venture. It's all just you know happenstance, which of course wasn't really true. I mean, I think what th there were individual circumstances in all in all those cases. But I think what happened was that because the casino status had changed, you know, we were no longer the sole independent. Um, it was a much easier sell if you worked at Merrill Lynch or Morgan Stanley or Goldman to go to the client and say, um, you know, it's all going to change. The whole thing's, you know, JP Morgan are going to take it over. They're going to try to sell you derivatives, etc you should um, think about changing your broker. And it only took one client to put their broker. I think it was, my, from recollection, I could have this wrong. I think it was the Prudential was the first major client to do it, to put their brokership up to, out for tender. And other clients, because before that, it had been very, very unusual to change your corporate broker. It was a bit like changing your auditor. It was something that you just didn't do, at least only very, very mm. rarely. Uh, and then suddenly clients said, well, okay, they're doing it. Maybe we should do it too. And so we had this rash of, um, of broker ships, uh, you know, sorry, broker repitches, many of which we, we lost. And it's interesting that you say, how did it feel? Because you'd think well, if you put it that way, it would have been really appalling. And of course, in some respects it was. But the fact is we replaced that business with much more, um, much more lucrative and in a way much more satisfying <laughs> advisory business. So on the IP, you know, I, it had been very, very difficult for Casanova to win major IPOs for years. And suddenly 
you put us with JP Morgan, who had the capital to lend to the private equity owners, who had the, the private equity ownership relationships. And frankly, they had the they had a better brand name from the point of view of selling international M&A and advisory than we did. You put them together and suddenly we were winning IPO mandates again. And really from the first two to three months of the joint venture, when we were all at each other's throats, the business was actually performing exceptionally well. So the, the biggest, looking back on it, the biggest problem was that when we got into a lot of fighting in the boardroom, which we did between the JP Morgan representatives and the Casanova representatives, they were able to use these brokership losses as a stick to beat us with and say, oh, it's all going wrong because you're losing all these mm-hmm. brokerships. Whereas, in fact, it was a much more natural evolution. You know, we had 50% of the of the FTSE, which was crazy, really. And we couldn't look after them all. We didn't. Really yeah, know. I know. It's, I mean, extraordinary, actually. Yeah. So actually, in some respects, it was a perfectly natural and healthy shakeout. And in some res- and in, in many cases, we got those clients back later on. I mean, HSBC being a good example. No, it's interesting. Let, let's just go back to some of the culture in Casino, because I think it's really interesting to reflect on what made it so successful and you know the 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 institution was a very unusual institution because it didn't publish research institutions basically had to deal with you because of the corporate list they were scared of being left off sub underwriting lists And, and of course they were scared of not having a good relationship with you because when something happened with one of your corporate clients they would naturally want to be early on the call but can you just talk about what was the thinking behind building up that research department and quite a lot of overhead? And, you know, you were starting at a big disadvantage to your two principal competitors. And I wanted to ask you about um, some of the people, but the, 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 the thinking behind building up the research department, what, what was it? That, did you feel suddenly that you needed to to publish research? Well, I think what it was, was that, Again, from from the, certainly from the time I joined and predating the time I joined, right up until the sort of early to mid nineties, the business. I mean, Casino never had a business model in the sense of something that people sat down and kind of strategized about. It just grew up organically and, and kind of worked. Um, but the business model, if you want to call it that, was that we focused on corporate broking as opposed to secondary market broking, which was a much bigger part of the business of a Holger Vett or a James Capel or, or what have you. And as you say, we, you know, we did secondary market broking, but we never really grew it as a business in its own right for its own sake. It was always there to enable us to distribute new issues and to give credible market related advice. What happened in the early noughties was that there was a kind of thinking, well, hang on, we're stockbrokers, we should do more stockbroking. And it became perfectly clear that you could no longer in that era run a secondary market, a grown-up secondary market stockbroking business without publishing research. I mean, the stated reason why we didn't publish research was that it might conflict with the interests of our corporate clients. I mean, the real reason was that the firm didn't want to invest the kind of money that would have been necessary in second, you know, in research analysts and all the rest of it in order to build that product. And it didn't really feel it was necessary either, because as you say, for institutions didn't deal with us because of the quality of our research. They dealt with us because of our endless stream of new issues. But in the early noughties, so that, that was challenged. So we thought, well, we can't do that anymore because if you can't win IPO business if you don't publish research. So we started to to do it and grow the secondary market business quite aggressively in the noughties. But when you did that, I mean, you, you were very, very skilled at, at- Hiring people. I mean, two of those talented analysts who trained at Casino became billionaires or half billionaires through their hedge funds. Nikolai Tangen at AKO Capital, now the head of the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, the largest in the world. And Ross Turner, who went to Lansdowne and then founded Pelham, which has been not so good recently. Um, In fact, Nikolai joined Edgerton before he went to AKO Capital. I mean, were there others I mean, what, and what did you think i mean how did you attract these people and were they stars when they were at casino or was it only later that they blossomed well the, all of those people and there were more of them there was you know stuart powers gorm thomason david fairweather i mean there was a whole uh, ralph yance michaeli karazi there was a whole bunch of names uh there well, of course i've forgotten stuart powers because he's gone on to found 
Hengisbury after being at TCI. So he's another um, exceptional, been exceptionally successful. And took took a number of the of the others. But what, what was it? Was it just that you had a really good head of research that was smart at identifying smart people and training them, or was there? Well, it was. It was in that, that all those guys worked for a European continental European small cap team run by a chap called David Croft. And David had an extraordinary ability to identify and train up analysts. And all those people worked for him. And I think what it was, was that David and his team focused on um, under-researched um, small and mid-cap companies. And they had a kind of contrarian approach. And the reason that we hired these people was you know, we could hardly generate any secondary market revenue off it at all because most of the time we weren't members of the local exchanges. So our clients had to pay double commission. But the idea was it would help us win capital markets business for small cap European stocks, uh, which kind of worked, although all of those guys were pretty fiercely independent. So you couldn't just say, well, we're doing this IPO. They'd say, well, we don't like the company. We don't want to do it. So the point was that even though we and, and and yes, they were regarded as stars, and there was a, a absolute recognition that we had a real center of excellence. The problem was we couldn't make any money off it because the secondary <laughs> market commission was useless. The IPOs we weren't leading IPOs; we were doing sort of co-lead roles, so we really couldn't monetize that expertise. And so one by one, they just got picked off. I mean, you know, you, if you're paying someone you know, a, a small cap secondary market broker salary and, and a big hedge fund comes along and says, why don't you come and, you know, t teach us how to short uh, mid cap European stocks, then, you know, giving them an extra thousand quid or a few extra bonus points isn't going to cut it. So, but you know, the good news was so that one by one, they all left and, but, you know, they became good clients of the firm from their hedge funds and, you know, really helped us build the, in that particular area of the firm and more broadly, the, secondary market business. So Lansdowne, for example, and Edgerton would have been two of our biggest institutional clients all through the noughties. Well, they're most people's, <laughs> most people's biggest clients, I think. Um, yeah, but um, on hiring, in 2001, you say in the book, you did three major hires who were all Etonians. Now, in the past, Casanova had hired from that school because there were family members of existing partners or friends. Now you were hiring them on merit. Did you? Did that not frighten you, or would you laugh? I, I laughed. I mean, um, we didn't. I, we didn't. We didn't set out to do it. It's just that's kind of the way it. Uh, the way it turned out. Um, I mean, there is a. There is a sort of germ of a serious point. I mean, you know, and these were all people who made a very big difference to the business. But I think that, you know, in the old days when I joined the firm, the, the firm was. 100% um, or the partnership was 100% male. It wasn't until I think it was 1994 that we appointed our first female partner. And in the late 90s, when I was running the corporate finance department and my partner, Nigel Rowe, was running the equities business, we started to recruit many more uh, women into the firm because, you know, and again, Casanova, it wasn't that much different from other firms. I mean, you know, I don't know. If we had no female partners in the 1980s, then a, a Rowan Pittman or a Horga Vett or a James Scaple might have had one or two each. So it wasn't like, so it was a it was a problem endemic to the city. So we did start hiring uh, a lot more women into the firm and into into the graduate program, and it made a bit of a difference. But you know, it was still became it, it was still a very white male dominated firm, and I think the difference between how you would run a firm today and how we ran firms even up until the noughties was that we just would never have made, we, we, we would have made it a much higher priority, I think, to diversify the, the workforce throughout the, throughout the firm. What, what was the dress code for women? You know, there wasn't a dress code. I mean, the only, I do vaguely remember, um, it may be in the early 90s, the late 80s, I think there was an edict went out that women could wear trousers in the office, which previously had not been allowed. But there wasn't, there was no dress code. The whole thing was, at least not that it was written down, it was all peer pressure. So, and, and there was a lot of pressure to conform because people, generally speaking, like to fit in, particularly when a firm has a very strong culture. So 
people did can tend to dress in quite a similar way at Casanova, and there was no question there was quite a there was quite an emphasis on how you dressed and how you were turned out, but nothing was ever said. I mean, you told the story earlier on, or you mentioned the story about the the Gucci shoes. I mean, I would I'd been with the firm three or four months. I don't I don't know what I was thinking why I did it, but I went into the firm wearing this pair of slip on Gucci loafers, and I had to go and see. Uh, David Barnett, who was one of the senior partners who oversaw the risk on the trading floor. I can't remember what I had to see him about, but we had, a, we had a chat and nothing was said, but throughout the conversation, he kept his eyes fixed on my shoes, never took his eyes off my shoes. So I got the message and, and, and never wore them again. So that was kind of the way it was reinforced rather than having something written down saying, thou shalt not wear slip on shoes. But there was kind of dress down Fridays, wasn't there? Because if you were going to the country, you could wear tweed or not? Oh, no, 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 no. No dress down Fridays, no, never. No, the, 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 the first thing that happened was when in 2005, when we completed the JP Morgan joint venture, all these guys turned up in our office in the spring of 2005 and didn't wear ties in the, um, in the office which was, I mean, everybody wore ties all the time at Casino right up until 2005. And I had a decision as CEO. I thought, well, am I going to essentially make a fool of myself by telling everyone they've got to wear ties or shall I just let it slide? So I let it slide and uh, it kind of uh, developed from there. But no, no, there was never any dress down the Fridays at uh, Casino, not at all. I, I remember those days as being very sensitive because... Um... Fleming sent round uh, a dress code um, memo and, you know, uh, just stipulating, you know, how you could dress down. And this was, I, I can't remember if it was before or after the acquisition by Chase, but, um, you know, the people at Chase were very, very casual and we were very, very non-casual and some compromise had to be reached. I can't remember for the life of me what, what it was, but one of my American friends has got quite a big business in the UK, emailed me and said, can you send me the dress code? Because all the businesses, I mean, it wasn't just um, in the city, all businesses were were um, having to cope. Now, tell me, um, you met lots of famous people along your journey at Kazanov, whether it was Jamie Dimon or John Templeton. Who, who were the most interesting people? Who were the most surprising people? That you came into contact with? Well, you've, I mean, you've already named two of them. I mean, Te Temple, John Templeton was a very interesting character. And I was listening to your podcast with uh, William Green a few weeks ago when he was talking about his interactions with him when he interviewed him, I think, for his, for his book. And we actually uh, floated Templeton's company in 1986. And uh, which was very unusual for us to do an IPO of a business without a merchant bank involved. We did it on our own. And I can't prove it, but T Templeton was a remarkable character, but he was a terrible snob in the way that only somebody born in Tennessee can be. And he was obsessed with lords and the British class system and all this kind of stuff. And I can't prove it, but I'm pretty sure what must have happened is he asked around when he was looking to IPO his company uh, in London and said, well, you know, who's the sort of snootiest broker in town and was told, well, you've got to go to Casino because they're the Queen's broker, which, of course, was always the line at the time. So he turned up and we, we IPO'd his, his business. And uh, that was very interesting. And then we actually, we acted as financial advisor when he sold his business to Franklin Resources in, in 1992. And that was actually the transaction that um, got me my partnership because I had set up our mergers and acquisitions department a couple of years earlier than that. And this was the first really big transaction we, we did. And Tem Templeton had, you know, he had a great fund of, of stories and was a very courteous uh, man, but a very um, unemotional and sort of somewhat cold man in a way that an awful lot of very top investment managers are, because I think in order to be a really successful investment manager, you have to think differently from other people. And that often goes with, you know, character traits, which are quite unusual. But um, I remember he'd had, when we IPO'd his business in 1986, he'd been talking to anyone. And his prediction at the time was, I forget the level, but he said, there's a better than evens chance that within the next two years, the Dow Jones is going to be more than a thousand or whatever it was. 
he, he predicted that the Dow Jones was going to go up to a level of which at the time people thought was inconceivable. And of course it happened. And I remember being in a taxi with him in London in 1992 and saying, well, Sir John, or whenever it was, I was saying, what's your next prediction? And he said, within the next two years, there's a better than evens chance that the average PE on the New York, on the, on the US market is going to be higher than the average PE on the Japanese market. And I forget the year, maybe it was 92, but it was at the absolute height of the Japanese market. And it was seemed inconceivable. But again, it was, um, it, it was absolutely right. So he was a, he was a bona fide genius, but again, which is an interesting fat feature, very naive when it actually came to selling his own business. And, you know, he ran a sort oh, really? of, yeah, he ran a kind of slightly cack-handed auction. Um, he, I think he was very much oversuaded by listening to people who told him what they wanted to hear. I mean, it all turned out okay in the end with Franklin, but there were a couple of other horses that we wanted to ride. And we actually thought, having done the work, we thought he was selling the company too cheaply. And I remember I had a, one of the most interesting meetings I ever had as a banker was sitting down with Templeton and, uh, and Patrick Donnelly, who was my partner at the time, who was um, in charge of the whole process and saying, look, Sir John, you're selling the, sh the company at whatever the price was. And our, our um, analysis shows that it should be that plus 20 percent. So if we're going to sign off on this deal, you have to help us understand why you would be selling a company at this at this level. To which he said, in a sort of rare moment of complete candor, he said that we're, you know, we're reliant on a mode of distribution for our funds, which is becoming obsolete. He was referring to the load funds because he used to charge an eight and a half percent front end load on his on his mutual funds back in those days. And essentially So wait, you 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 invested you invested a hundred dollars and only ninety one and a half went into the fund. Absolutely, and and when he used to get when he used to get asked this question by London investors when he was IPOing, he, he'd say, "Well, my friend Joe, or whatever his name was, put a thousand dollars into the growth fund in nineteen fifty four, and it's now worth a hundred thousand dollars, and he he doesn't begrudge the you know the eight hundred and fifty dollars, the eighty five dollars it cost him to do it, or something like that." But but anyway, he. Um, he uh, he was a, he was a good illustration of something I've seen over my career, which is that very often very successful entrepreneurs find it very difficult to believe that the business that they have uh, created is worth what they think it is. But sorry, that was a long long winded answer about Templeton. But you know, I mean, it was it was fascinating seeing Jamie Dimon up close because he had literally just come into J.P. Morgan when we were negotiating our joint venture. And he actually, it was pretty clear he hated the whole idea. He didn't like, doesn't like joint ventures. Uh, you know, he was saying, well, why don't we just buy the company? But I think he wasn't sufficiently focused on it at that point. And he was too new really to impose his will. And uh, we said, so, but David and I saw a lot of Jamie in the early days as he, as he sort of refashioned JP Morgan. And he was very different from what I was expecting because I thought he'd be sort of technocratic and humorless. And in fact, he's a very, he's a very engaging and human person. I mean, I think I was never on the wrong side of his tongue. So I never saw that side of him, but, um, you know, fascinating, you know, fascinating person. Steve Schwartzman came to see us when we were looking to raise equity after we incorporated in 2000, nothing happened, but, you know, super, Super smart guy, uh, very very impressive, and yeah, a lot of that. What were the conversation? What was the conversation with Schwartzman like? Well, it was general. I think. I mean, I think that he was introduced to us by uh, by um, Ronnie Grierson, who was a great sort of city networker in those days, who'd come out of GEC, and um, he kind of brought him along to see us. I mean, Schwartzman was pretty well known at that point. Blackstone was pretty well known, but nothing like what they are today. And I think he probably had some notion that he would use us as the nucleus of an advisory business. They had a bit of advice in those days, mostly set around debt restructuring. But I think, um, I remember it was, it was a long meeting. It was quite, it started about six in the evening and, and we were there for, you know, most of these meetings have a natural life of an hour. And we were there for at least two, if not two and a half hours. Um, Nigel Rowe, who ran the equities business and I, and uh, we talked around various subjects, but I just remember thinking that when it came to clearly explaining the, uh, 
the realities of the financial world, whether it was M and A or private equity. I, I, it, it was a real tour de force, and I thought he was, um, yeah, a very very smart guy. Why why would a meeting only last an hour? Because it seems, I mean, it's an incredibly complicated thing to explain in an hour. Well, I mean, would it not take you two hours normally to, you know, explain the business, what you did, what sort of thing you were seeking to achieve? I'm, I'm very surprised that you say that you could get good. Yeah, well, I mean, if it's, a, if it's a formal meeting as part of a process, that's right. But I mean, th this meeting was really more of a kind of introductory get to know you type meeting. And, th and that's what I was referring to. Those kinds of meetings of which I've had many, many over the years tend to have a kind of natural lifespan or time span of an hour. And then if there's more to discuss, then you obviously go on to, to do other things afterwards. But, um, but you know, I just do remember that one went, went on for quite a bit longer. Well, listen, it's been fascinating um, hearing about the Kazanov story and the book Blue Blood is really, uh, I mean, it's a really great read. How, how long did it take you to, to write it? And the book stops when you left in 2008, which is kind of like an unnatural point um, when we're now in 2023. Have you thought at all about What's happened in the intervening 15 years? I mean, I can understand why you might not want to write about Kazanov not having been there um, in the intervening period. But do you have any observations about that? Well, it kind of, I mean, the reason I stopped in 2008, <coughs> excuse me, is partly because that's when I left. But also, and, you know, I talk about there's a bit of an epilogue for the next year. But I mean, Kazanov, I mean, the reality is it effectively ceased to exist at the beginning of 2010, which is when JP Morgan bought out the 50% of the joint venture that they didn't own. So I don't think there's a meaningful story to be written about Casanova at that point. Somebody could write a book about JP Morgan and the JP Morgan UK business, but I'm not sure it'd be a particularly engaging read. I mean, it took me, it took me about nine months to write. And, you know, the question you might've asked is, well, why did you wait so long having left in 2008? And I mean, the answer is that, well, partly life just got in the way. I'd always thought I wanted to write the story because I thought it was an interesting story, which had general application. How you go from being a small owner-managed founder business, essentially, to go through that sort of growth path that where you end up as a kind of an institutionalized business, let alone something that's capable of going into, into partnership with a, with a monster bank like JP Morgan. So I thought... These are lessons which quite a lot of um, businesses could potentially learn from. But I think when I first left in 2008, I mean, the, the experience of running the joint venture, and there was quite a lot of fighting in the boardroom, um, which eventually I got fed up with, which is why I left. Uh, it was pretty raw. And I just think I felt that if I wrote the book then, I, you know, the temptation to kind of try to settle scores or put the record straight, all this kind of stuff, I think would have been. So I just put it in a box. And then for, for no particularly good reason, I just decided that it was something that I ought to do. So no, I, I, did, the I did the first draft in about nine months. Well, I, I'm, I'm pleased you did. I recommend people do go out and buy the book and, and, and read it. Um, where can people find you if they want to get in touch with you, Robert? Best thing is on LinkedIn. I'm I'm on LinkedIn. That's probably the best network to get hold of me. Well, listen, thank you so much for being on. I've enjoyed the conversation and good luck with the book. Great. Thank you, Steve. Enjoyed it. Thanks very much. Thank you for listening. I'm Steve Clapham. That was the Behind the Balance Sheet podcast. Please don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel and why not visit our website, behindthebalancesheet.com, where you can find the show notes and lots of other videos which can help you on your investing journey. Thank you for watching.